let me welcome here Nicole. And we are um, long friends with Nicole. We've been just uh, preparing for this uh, conversation about 20 years of agility. And thinking that we've seen each other last time nearly a year ago in Belgium or Holland. Was it Holland, right? Is Holland for a conference mm -hmm. and we actually went for dinner and have such a great chat so we thought uh, we might redo it here and talk about all those interesting things uh, from the past and look into the future as well so uh, without further delay right so tell us something nicole about yourself about myself. How you grew up. What <clears throat> made you the person who you are now? That's a lot of questions. Let, let's start with how I um, became agile, I guess. Um, let me start by saying I'm um, not an agile person by nature at all. I love structure. I love plans. I love to know what's coming up. You know, I, I've been living in this house for 30 years. So, so I like the same, I hate change, but still uh, I've learned to become more agile. And so um, my background, I have a background in math and computer science. And uh, I started as a programmer in the um, waterfall world. And then in 2003, I, uh, I worked for, as a contractor for Philips Research, so it's R&D. And they did this really funny thing called Scrum. And in 2003, it was really new. And everybody thought uh, my manager was crazy. Like, wait, what are you doing? You know, Scrum, what is this? Um, because it was totally new. In the Netherlands, he, he was the first one to introduce it. it you know, you know the manifesto just got signed two years before. And so this is how I learned about Scrum. And I thought he was crazy too, until I got used to it and i've been doing scrum and agile ever since um for like uh, now up to now as a coach and trainer so Maybe that's some big names in your uh, in your history like uh, you've been uh, taught by mike Cohn and mary popendick and henrik nieberg and... yeah that was the fun part of being one of let's say the the pioneers there weren't that many books yet. There weren't like a thousand frameworks. We had Scrum and maybe ex extreme programming and that was it. There were no books about how to do transitions or anything like that. And the big names uh, like my comb were still traveling and affordable. Um, so yes, I got my CSM from my cone. Uh, and then we had other people like uh, Mary and Tom Popendick come over and Joshua Karyavsky and Diana Larson. And uh, yeah, it was great to, to be trained by all these you know, early pioneers of Agile. And we had a lot of fun doing it too. Yes, definitely. Mm -hmm. I would like to see Mike Cohn traveling. I thought he's now like sitting. <laughs> he doesn't in... travel anymore. No. Yeah, exactly, right? <laughs> yeah. So yeah, it was fun. And of course, we had the social stuff around it because these people came from far. Like I live in the in the Netherlands, and they came from the United States. So you know, we take them out for dinner, or we show them around our country, and it was really good times. Definitely. Mm -hmm. um, I remember um, taking. Mary and Tom Poppendick uh, to an aquarium because they're always very eager to visit the country. And we were going to go to mini Holland, mini you know, miniature things, but it was raining so hard that we decided to go to an aquarium with my kids in, in the back seat. And, uh, and they were, I had Tom in my car. And, and so my, my kids were teaching him how to come to 10 in Dutch, you know, and it was just, it's just this, yeah, good times with all these people. Yeah, definitely. So you have two kids, right? The oldest is 27 now and the youngest 23. 24 so already, yeah. 24 yeah. already, yeah. yeah. Growing fast. So mm -hmm. they are grown up, right? Yes. But I believe you have some nice story about them really using some scrum at the college or something like that, right? Yeah, well, they grew up with a, a, a scrum mother. Uh, and so we did scrum at home. Uh, they used Scrum or well, task boards for, to do their homework or to prepare for, for tests or exams. Uh, we did children's parties 
with a scrum board and you know put all the activities on it and then the kids would put it in in progress and then to done and they had the best party um when we did something big like a, my birthday party for grown-ups you know in the morning i would make this board of tasks to do and the whole family would just know what to pick up and you know like order this and go, go to the bakery and do this and and it worked and it really avoided a lot of um stress you know like why didn't you do this and you should have done that and so they grew up with scrum and so my daughter caroline when she went to college uh she went to uh study business in college and they were teaching her stage gated project management uh, but uh, no scrum. So um, she introduced scrum in college. She taught, she taught her, her teachers about scrum, which I thought was um, really cool. Yes. Mm -hmm. And my oldest kid uh, helped me uh, create videos. We, we made this channel for Made to Agile. Um, we went to conferences together. We've done sessions together. So yeah, we're a, we're a scrum family. Mm -hmm. So how is it? Does a Scrum work because it's research or and it would never work in product development as they keep telling you or is it vice versa, right? That, that was the research and... Yeah, you know, like like I said, I, I started, I discovered Scrum at, at, in research, Philips research and the whole world said we were crazy, but I would tell my colleagues who were our friends who were in other kinds of software development our businesses and they said, yeah, all right, well, maybe this works in research, but it's never gonna work where in product development. We do, we make real products, so it's never gonna work. So that was 2003, 2004, a lot of skepticism, a lot of uh, resistance. Uh, well, as you know, you know, it just has taken off in all those years. And now you do it in schools and in construction and marketing and everywhere there's Scrum and the bigger uh, frameworks. And uh, the, the funniest thing I think is uh, I've returned to Philips Research this last year. I'm still there now as an agile coach. And now people there, there's the same resistance, but now people there are saying, well, you know, agile, um, that works for product development, but it is never going to work here because we do research. So it's just like, oh, you know, we're back to back to the beginning. Yeah, back to the beginning. So what do you do with that type of resistance? What is your advice as an agile coach? How to overcome? Oh, I would say go step by step. It's easier now than in the beginning when it was totally new because now there's still, it's easier to find people who are in favor of it or who have seen it work somewhere else. There are more examples. Um, so that helps to find the people who are in favor of it, who are willing to try out things that really work. So I usually try to find the people who want to make it work and, and work from there. That would be my advice. But the resistance, it's everywhere you go, it's the same, whatever, whatever company you're in or whatever field you're in. And there's a lot of fear behind it. People are they're like me, they don't like change. You know, they're afraid of losing stuff. They, they have priorities or they have whatever, you know, they might be scared of losing their job or of losing the desk near the window or whatever. And yeah, you have to help them overcome change. So maybe because I hate change, I'm good at understanding people who don't want to change, yeah. We are right. No one wants to change, right? No one, nobody wants to be changed. If you decide it by yourself, yes. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you see it that way also? Yeah, I see it the same way. It's like uh, every other company has this sort of statement, like it will never work for us because we are different, right? It's not going to yeah. work here. Yes. Yes. We are all different here, right? In one thing, at least, right? Mm -hmm. So. We talk also about uh, prioritization, right? And that um, sometimes you have so many ideas of things. So what is important for you now? What is in your head, like your current focus? Um, ooh, right now. To get back at where I was two years ago, um before i got sick two years ago i got uh diagnosed with breast cancer 
and exactly two years ago in January. And um, it's been a journey. It's been a long journey. And right now I'm just like, how do I get back on track at where I was two years ago before? That I guess, and, um, and how, do you, how do you lead a full life? That's a hard thing to be done. Well, how well, Scrum helps you or Agile helps you with that overcoming this disease? Was there any help in the personal agility level in your mind? Or? Yeah, well, the, the, well, maybe it's not funny, but when I, uh, I, get, uh, I get diagnosed uh, and then I got treatment plan and I, I, I was entitled to the whole thing, like, um, you know, 16 chemos and surgery and radiotherapy 20 times. And I started counting. I was like, oh my God, it's, it's a year. It's going to take a year to get rid of this thing. And, and I was like, oh, it was so overwhelming. And like with anything big, um, I was like, okay, you know, how do you eat an elephant? Remember, remember you know, one slice at the time. So go step by step. And as a scrum teacher, I always said, um, uh, you can scrum anything. So my husband who's also, you know, he's used to me and he's also very good at scrum and all that. And we said, okay, well, let's, let's just scrum it, scrum it. So we scrummed the whole year, in fact, now two years. And uh, we, we made fun of also like, okay, what is the product? Who is the product owner? um uh who's on the team uh just you know see can we make it a, a project can we make it a scrum project and um i started to uh, have weekly sprints uh that helped uh slicing it up helped uh having fun with it also helped so i decided i was the product owner definitely <laughs> i was the product owner and in the beginning then what was the product in the beginning i thought well the product's probably my body and i went to uh, I want my body back. I want a healthy body. That was in the beginning. Uh, how do you get there? And uh, what can I do? Because as a um, as a patient, like it was pretty clear that there was this the medical team, which was cross functional. I like to see that. <laughs> you, know, you keep having this like weird uh, co agile coach mindset where you go like, oh, how cool! A cross functional medical team. Uh, that's cool. Like, uh, what are the processes? But um, I left that there. I trusted them. I wasn't going to question the whole treatment. Um, but I always like, what can I do? What can, what can I do to help this whole thing, uh, to go, to go through it? And, um, I said, all right, well, usually when I don't feel good, um, I tend to kind of, uh, hide hide away from people you know and go to bed and whatever so i said well i need to keep on exercising i need to keep on seeing people uh, stuff like that and every every sprint of the week i put that in my to-do list like i had to exercise exercise four times a week i had to see five people or talk or, or call or things like that you know and believe it or not being crazy as I am, I, I even set up a set of metrics. <laughs> oh, I thought, okay, let's have some metrics. Let's measure this whole project. Um, and I thought, well, what, what should I measure? Right? As I measured, okay, every day I measured how did I, how, my wellness, how did I eat, how did I sleep? And I kept those metrics for a while. And then I had my update with the doctor and I came with, I had it all printed out and it was like, look, here are my metrics, you know? And she didn't even look at them. And I was like, okay, like usual, you know, metrics make no, make no sense if nobody looks at them. So that's how it helped. It definitely helped me get through it. Also, not put, I started by, I used Trello. I started by putting all the treatments there. I was like, no, 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 one step at a time. Let's start with, you know, four treatments. And then, you know, maybe it changes and let, let's go step by step. Uh, Let's go there. Yeah, that helped. Have you been doing a retrospective as well? Oh, and definitely. <laughs> well, the metrics help kind of see for every 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 cycle, every chemo mm -hmm. cycle. At some point, we were like, oh yeah, the third day of the cycle is your worst one. Mm -hmm. And so we adapted. Like my husband did go to work, but on the third day he mm -hmm. left late and he came back early because I felt miserable. All the other days were fine. I could handle mm -hmm. it. So yeah, you you. 
you did a retrospective and you kind of, I kind of changed my product goal also. Yeah. So in the beginning it was my body. And then of course more, it became more like me, my body and mind. Cause you kind of, it affects the way you think for a while too. So it's, and then I thought the project would be over after the last treatment, but that's in fact when it's, well, it's not when it starts, but it, it wasn't over. It wasn't a project. It started to be this life thing. Cause you have to kind of climb back also. Mm-hmm. So I still do it. I still have weekly sprints uh, where I have to exercise and I have to, well, I'm back at work, not full time, but I'm back at work. I have to do fun things. And then COVID of course, COVID hit. So I was just ready to go back into the world. And then we had COVID ask for a new adaptation but now this time for of everyone so everyone had to deal with something difficult that makes it easier when everyone has it yeah doesn't it it does i guess so yes Mm -hmm. so what do you think changed through the past last year of COVID? how do you see change at the organization level uh, of them embracing agility or uh, increasing resistance or what are those things you notice? Um, yeah, like everybody has already said, like suddenly everything became possible that wasn't before, right? Like working from home. Mm-hmm. Wow, we, we were at Philips and at one point oh, and we were all sent home and that was it. And I think IT did a great job and we could all you know, start working from home, something that people did occasionally, but now we all did it. Um, I, uh, as the first speaker already said, uh, you know, online tooling, there's suddenly there's so much more tooling. We learned how to deal or work with Zoom and um, there's still a lot of bad meetings out there. I think they've gotten worse. Yeah, we already had bad face-to-face meetings and now we have, uh, even worse, uh, it, it takes extra, extra energy and time to run a good meeting. Definitely. Mm-hmm. Yes. And of course, we'll miss being together. Mm-hmm. Don't you miss being together? I do. I do. I yeah. miss it a lot. I you know, yeah. have conferences, like going around the wa- wa- uh, the, the walks and around yes. and talking to people, right? Exactly. It's such yeah. a great thing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Now it's a virtual, that's not bad either, right? So what would you recommend to the Scrum Masters, right? Like uh, I sometimes have those Scrum Masters who are saying, I'm new hire in March, I've never seen my team and they are not even showing up on a video. What should I do? So what is your recommendation on that thing? I think with every team, what you used to do in, in let's say together, do it again, but twice as much and, and suddenly, We've become so rude. I uh, the other day I was in a meeting. I was doing a little training of an, an hour, explaining something at at Phillips, and seven people joined. And I was like, okay, do we all know each other? Uh, no, you know. And I was like, well, in a real room, you would probably have come in and said, hi. I'm you know shaking hands and just said I'm I'm this and this person. And online, we kind of hide away, turn off the camera, and uh, there's even less social interaction than could be possible. So Did you show up once you say it? No. <laughs> <laughs> well, these people, yes, I finally, yes. Oh, they okay. Did. Yeah, 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 they did because I said so, yes. And they, we did a little round of introductions. Um, for any Scrum Master, I would say do uh, team kickoffs, talk to people. Um, and we, we seem to have forgotten all that stuff that we did uh and yeah get get mural or myro or anything collaboration uh a board a whiteboard to collaborate if your company allows it is that mm-hmm. not always um the case right uh for the longest time because of security reasons and privacy reasons and things like that uh we weren't allowed to to use these kind of tools that makes it harder zoom wasn't allowed we remember all the privacy problems zoom had in the beginning so it took a while to adapt yes yeah and if you're in i don't know if you're allowed to have small cp it depends on the country you're in right now in holland we're in pretty pretty big lockdown um 
but if you are in a country where you can see two or three people, then as it's, and if they're in the area, I would go visit or try to meet up somehow, mm -hmm. if it's possible. Yes. So what's your uh, favorite book? Ooh, um, what is my favorite book? I was just reading The Truth About Employee Engagement by Lencioni. Mm -hmm. um, I like that. I like, uh, uh, I like the, the one about retrospectives, um, you know, making a, a good teams great, right? Retrospective book uh, by Diana Larson. I really like that one. I know there's more now online also to be found, but that's really my retrospective Bible. It's the basis of everything. I like mm -hmm. management 3.0. Yeah. Um, and I like novels <laughs> in my spare time. Mm -hmm. Yes. What about you? What's your latest favorite book? Latest favorite book? Latest favorite book. I didn't have a right time to read a book because I was writing one and now I'm done with uh, doing it and still recovering from that. So I guess I was not really reading past year that much. But uh, if Was I think it, your Scrum Master book or have you written? Uh, I did another one that's okay. Agile Leader and it's been published December last yeah. year. So it's still sort of fresh in my head. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah. And I guess my favorite book would be Lessa Atkins, uh, yeah. The Agile Coaching Coach. Teams. It was one of those where I was always coming back and uh, mm -hmm. like it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I also like from the other perspective, the Goiko Ajic, the impact mapping. Yes. Yeah. Uh, like one coach side and the other one, the business side, right? And uh, all those other things. So. Currently, what is, uh, you, you said you started working, right? So do you teach classes or do you coach or do you do mixture or what's on your mind? Yeah, so I'm back at Philips Research uh, as a coach. Uh, we do a really big uh, change there from, let's say, stage gated uh, processes or, or, or true um, research, like they have their own process, exploratory process. Mm -hmm. uh, to uh, Agile, um, they, they, they have a, kind of taken a, a famous uh, skilled Agile framework <laughs> and adapted it to make it work for, uh, for research. So that's what I'm doing. And then there's still the Scrum trainings. And of course, yeah, I've done, last year I've done two or three in, in classroom trainings when it was possible. Mm -hmm. And the rest is, is all uh, online. Um, mm -hmm. Which you know you you notice now that people are getting used to it, and you also know you notice like, like the, the first time like the Miro like nobody had ever touched Miro and the skills were low and now people were like oh yeah I'm a Miro board let's you know put some post its on it and mm -hmm. and and also the way you interact together online goes a lot better I think mm -hmm. so uh, that's that's I'm glad to see that it makes them. The training's better, I think, now that people are used to being online. Mm -hmm. Now, what about you? You see it too? I see the same thing. People got used to the tools, right? Used yes. to the environment, but they still prefer to go face to face if they have to. So they still keep asking me, Are you going back to face to face? And it's like, I don't know. Right? Yeah. So, so if you should uh, choose the ideal sort of split, like training versus coaching, what is it? What is your sweet spot? And why? I like I like to do both because you want to have the stories, the latest stories. You want to um, stay in the field. Um, but I love training. I and, and I before COVID, I loved to travel. I would go to like uh, I would go to France to give training, or to Malaga. I've been, you know, the place. I like, I like that. I like interacting with other people, other cultures. So, and then you need a little travel time. Um, but I think what I used to do was like coach for three days a week, and then do two or three trainings a month, 
Mm -hmm. I thought that was the great balance. I see with me, if I do, I know there's trainers who do like Monday, Tuesday training, and then Thursday, Friday, and then the next week and again and again, but that would just uh, wear me out. And, and I would probably on Thursday think, oh, did I already tell this joke on, or not? Or was that the other training or uh, that's too much re repetition, I guess, for me, but uh, mm -hmm. might be good for other people. Mm -hmm. um but i think that's nice to be able to teach but also tell the latest stories mm -hmm. i think that's important and, and one of the things you often recommend is to have a vision so uh who do you want to be and what is important so who do you want to be five years from now <laughs> well when i um when i got uh cured Right, I, I felt this uh, big pressure that uh, I was like, okay, I survived cancer and now, now I have to be, do something extremely valuable with this extra time, you know? So I kind of felt this pressure to become like Mother Teresa or, you know, heal the world or, or something extremely meaningful because I was given that time. And that gave a lot of pressure because I'm not Mother Teresa. Um, and then I was like, yeah, what do I want to do? And I don't have a vision for five years, but I did have some new things. Like when I was in the hospital, uh, I was amazed to see how much intrinsic motivation those people have, the, the medical staff, mm -hmm. the nurses. I mean, these people were so sweet and they were working through lunchtime if I had extra questions. And I was like, wow, this is really cool. I, this so I almost switched to I was like I'm gonna be a nurse but it's not really me probably but then it's like okay what do I want to do if I want to make that impact or if I want to make that change what can I do it helps to be working for Philips they're into the medical world they make new you know machines and things for the medical world so that's healthcare and then there's like how can you make an impact in your own world how I think when I was a, a mother of young children, you don't even have to wonder about that. I mean, just getting through the day and having happy, healthy children and balancing it all, that's enough, right? <laughs> it's like, you don't need a vision, uh, but they've left the house and they need me less. And so who, how are you gonna make an impact for people? And I think you can do little steps. So I, uh, before COVID, well, I volunteer at a home for people with Alzheimer's. Um, I work with refugees and you can make little impact. You, I realized you don't have to be Mother Theresa to make a big impact. So yes, I do think about it more. I like the small steps. Small steps, yeah. Small steps towards, okay, I wanna be more meaningful for people or, or, or I wanna be healthier or, I want to be uh, a better mother or whatever you want to be, have that vision and then take small steps towards it. Mm -hmm. I would recommend to do that, yes. Um, and if someone has a question, you know the process, right? You show up, you can raise your hand. There is an icon for that. And if you can find the icon, just wave on us, right? And in the meantime, we continue. So yeah, maybe people want to share how they got through illness or COVID for that mm -hmm. matter, you know, they, they, they apply this agility. We all have to be suddenly very agile. That's life makes you become agile because you can plan so many things and you might like structure like I do, but things happen, good things like having babies. So, but that has a huge impact, right? You have to adapt bad things like uh, illness or divorce or, or, or loss or or COVID. So um, that would be interesting to hear or see how people cope with it if they also found that they had to be agile about it. Anybody wants to share? You can always raise your hand to us, right? If you find that way. So I found uh, recently a small notepad from one of the conferences where one of the speakers asked us about your value. And I'll write it down because he asked us to write it down on a piece of paper and then he's been asking about some other questions. Mm -hmm. So what is your value? If you should write down one value, what it would be? 
Mm, personal value. Mm -hmm. I guess reliability is a big one. You can trust me. Oh, somebody raised a hand. I see. Uh, but one value, that's so hard. Um, uh, maybe love. Uh, is that a value? I'm not sure. Sure. <laughs> Friendship. Yeah. Very important. I see Adrian raised a hand. I'm trying to. Hello, everybody. So enjoying the talk. Um, yeah, I also went through a, a life threatening illness at one point, and um, that kind of got me onto a religious path. And so I've become a Christian after that. Um, and during COVID, uh, I'm a member of our local church. And obviously, all of a sudden, we couldn't go to church anymore. And um, we had a website, wasn't great. Uh, we were kept thinking about maybe doing something with YouTube and like we had all these great ideas, but nothing ever materialized. And then uh, COVID came around and all of a sudden I formed an agile team and I agiled the hell out of the church. <laughs> no pun intended. So cool. uh, <laughs> yeah, I think COVID made a lot of things possible, right? Yeah, and so we created a Trello board and we did a bit of brainstorming and we got a team together and we started doing stuff. And so we created a YouTube channel. We got a web team together. We started updating our website regularly. We uh, put out a weekly newsletter. So we got an editorial team together and started co-creating articles and um, bringing together the different uh, interest groups within the organization to to um, share information of what they were going to do and we created a tech support team to help them get going with zoom and um, trello and slack and all those cool things that they were using so in the space of one year we've transformed this church from being pretty much entirely in person to having this thriving online presence and in fact we've we've done such a great job that we've caught the attention of a lot of our neighboring churches and they all are wanting to know what our secret was and it was it was the agile way of doing stuff breaking nice. elephants down into small bites mm -hmm. cool. thank you for sharing cool you're welcome nice nice to hear some stories from you guys so if anyone here has a story show up here so the values, right? Values are important. I was recently working in an organization who actually made those values part of their sort of evaluation performance process, right? They say it's not just about competencies, but it's also about values. It and is. how much are we living those values? And which values do I want to develop? And right. I said sort of performance process because it was not any like a formal like evaluation, right? It was more like self-driven assessment etc and i found it really interesting in agile organizations so uh what do you think is the most important from organizational perspective as a value in agile space well i'm not here if it's a value but you know to let go of control especially big organizations uh where i'm at again I, that's one trust trust uh, that goes together right you let go of control you trust the team or you trust people mm -hmm. um stop measuring everything with kpis and other things you know just trust give people trust i mean uh at least in places where i work people are uh motivated they're highly educated they're adults so we don't have to um we don't have to micromanagement manage them and I, I so agree with you when you say about value so you asked about new scrum masters what they should do uh, one of the things I always do is have them talk to their teams about what are your values uh, first uh, and you can do it with like say uh, the moving motivators from management 3.0 or with a list of values that you can find anywhere on the internet and, and I start with, okay, what are your personal values? So what is important? Like the five or 10 things that are important to each team members. And that helps also to get to know each other. If, you know, one person really values freedom, then you understand some of the behavior and you might understand why they don't like to be forced to do stuff because they feel like, you know, it's not free. 
Um, so usually, so we start with the uh, personal values and then we go look at the team values. So as a team, what do we value, what, what's important? And then indeed uh, go to maybe like the company uh, values. Um, and how can we make them, how can we live those values? And uh, what do they mean to us? And um, of course we all wanna uh, please our customers, right? We all wanna have happy customers and we all wanna deliver fast and we wanna make the right thing. But what do we do for our, our workers? Uh, which I think is really, yeah. So Lencio in his book also just stresses that again, right? But if you have, yeah, it has to start with happy, motivated workers, employees, and then uh, things just go a lot better. Yeah. Is that what you yeah, think well, also? Yeah, um, um, I agree. I agree. Trust is the key. If there is no trust, yeah, nothing works really. Yes. So yeah, I remember Day Diana Larson once had a session at a conference. Uh, it was called "The First Thing to Build Is Trust." Right, mm -hmm. that's where it has to start. But mm -hmm. um, trust is low in many, or especially the bigger the organization, the lower the trust level. And it also takes time to build it. Mm -hmm. It's it's hard. Yeah, it's not yeah. built overnight, and uh, no, that makes it tough because people got tired of um, working in those environments, etc. Yes. But how do you prioritize? You know, you once said to me that uh, there is always a lot of things to be done, but the time is limited. So uh, how do you help people to prioritize, companies to prioritize, teams to prioritize, whatever context you want? It makes it, yeah, it makes it hard. I, I discovered when I, when I was ill and I just had this tiny little bit of energy every day, prioritizing was easier. So then, let's say it was so scarce time that it was like, it was obvious what was the one thing I was going to do that day, the one fun thing, or uh, it's easier if you can only pick one thing than when, you know, there was more energy. I was like, oh, I can do two or three things. And then it becomes a lot harder. So usually I think in companies, that's also very obvious. It's always pretty sure, clear. What is the top thing? If you could only choose one thing, what would it be? But then when we get you know, more teams or more time or more money uh, and we can do more things, uh, it's harder to prioritize. Um, so so usually it helps by saying, okay, if we only had one thing, to, if we could only do one thing, what would that be? And how does it fit in the values and, and the goals that we wanna do achieve? Uh, and otherwise there's this, you know, all these activities you can do by prioritizing features, uh, or I, I really like the activity called buy a feature where you'll give them monopoly money, right? All the stakeholders, and then they actually can spend, only spend it once and they can put their money on features. Uh, it makes more visible that you can't have everything, right? It, resources are scarce and they always are. They always are. Um, and you can't just say yes to everything. It, not in life and not at work. Uh, and sometimes, you know, the customers say, I want it all like a kid in a candy store. But uh, it's like, no. It's mo I've never been in a situation when the, where there was more money or capacity than wishes or never. Have you? <laughs> never no. <laughs> I have so many ideas <laughs> all the time. And exactly, so yeah. In your personal life also, yeah. And then even if you have a lot of energy, then time's limited, right? So um, that's, true. that's again, and then have that vision. Where do we want to go? What do we want to achieve? Or what's our goal? What is your personal goal? And how uh, mm -hmm. does your time, money, or energy, or whatever, mm -hmm. your research, how do they mm -hmm. fit into it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. If you reflect the 20 years plus minus of this agile journey, right? Mm -hmm. What was the most eye-opening moment? Mm, um, um, I'll tell you a story. I once uh, was at a company where we did a so-called transition, right? And in the beginning, the the whole IT department and of course then the business they 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 adopted scrum and agile 
and there was resistance like always and especially this this man who came up to me and he he hated it he really hated it um and he had a lot of trouble just going to work in teams and um and we spent a year all together with the whole department and in the end we i did an evaluation so we had we moved to fixed teams people were educated people learned uh, how to work together they had to become t-shaped so it was really big big change and in the end i did at every team i did an evaluation and this gentleman actually said well you know in the end it's better than it was before <laughs> i was like oh wow i almost cried because that was like a very big compliment i guess i mean that was his way of saying hey this is fantastic mm -hmm. um and that was an eye opener i guess the eye opener was that it takes it takes time but in the end most people like it better I mean, there's always one or two where like, it's like, I really don't like this way of working. I like to be all solo by myself. Uh, I don't want to live, work in teams. Mm -hmm. That's it. You know, I don't believe it. Or I just, it just doesn't go well with me. But so that the eye opener, I guess, is too, that in the end, it, it works out. And it, it really takes, it takes time. It takes a year. It takes two years, sometimes three years. Yes. Gail has one person who raised the hand. Yeah, Gail. And, ah, here you are. Cool. I'm trying to unmute you, but I think you need to unmute yourself as well. Pedro? Yeah. Hi. Okay. You mentioned that you were busy with the transformational team and then you had to do some, um, you have to show some progress. I would like to know what sort of tools did you use to show progress? And the reason why I'm asking that is I'm also an agile coach and I'm also helping people through transformation. And the question that people keep on posing or management keep on posing to me is show me your progress, you know? Mm -hmm. And my stance is always as an agile coach, I plant seeds. I can tell you I've planted seed. I can tell you I'm gonna water it but then the seed must grow by itself. But they're looking for some sort of measure as to how do I say, this is what I've done and this is where the teams are at. Yes, that's an excellent question. It really is um, because that's everywhere. Like, oh, how can we measure how far we are in our transformation? And I've seen the worst things where um, scrum masters had to measure how many people attended their meetings and how often they did the events, you know, and I, all that is just ceremony. It doesn't work. So I think the most important things are still customer satisfaction or stakeholder satisfaction or whoever we're doing this for and team satisfaction. So we, we did measure those things like um, after every sprint, uh <clears throat> the product owner would send out this this tiny little questionnaire to all this the main stakeholders like on a you know on a scale from one to five how happy are you with the product that we delivered how happy are you with our um cooperation together and uh so it was product as in amount of product that we deliver and then quality of the product and our cooperation with you you know, and every every sprint they measured it to see and of course if it was really low that was a good reason to to talk to the customer or stakeholder like okay you, you gave us a two what can we what went wrong and what can we do better next time and so that worked and on a let's say more transformational level uh the company i just described people had to become t-shaped they were very specialized and they were allowed to make their own plan. Like, okay, this is what I can do. This is what I'm interested in. Uh, this is how I want to grow. And this is how I'm going to do it. I'm going to do courses or pair programming or whatever, whatever, read books, whatever it was their plan to get there. And then at the end, that was being assessed also. Like, how much more T-shaped are you now? And it was how much T-shaped are you? And how much did you help other people to become T-shaped? 
because how much of your knowledge do you share with your teammates? I think those are pretty much the only really reasonable things because some, I, I really do believe in education. So some training uh, as a starter. So some companies, uh, they're like measuring how many people got trained. That could be a measure of at least, okay, knowing what is the level of knowledge in, in the company. But yeah, I, I, especially results, I think are the most important ones. What do you think, Gail? What, what, how have you been measuring it then? So when I, when I started, I, I said, you know, I'm going to work from a clean slate. Acted as if nobody has gone on agile training. So I started off with all the rituals. And based on that, I could provide our EXCO team uh, indication to say all these teams has done this particular trainings. And then I could indicate it with a smiley face or with a sad face. But now my challenge is the foundation is there. And mm -hmm. now they want to, I mean, I was asked yesterday, I must present a heat map of where teams are at. Yes. And, and I said that for me is kind of difficult because I can think you are where I think you're at, but in actual fact, you are hiding from me and you are not giving me a true sense of where you are. So I'm just scared if I must go and do heat maps per teams that I may understand or interpret things wrong and I mm -hmm. could hurt people in the process. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to know from the forum, is there anything else I can use besides going to use a, use a, a, a heat map or something? Something that I've done before, I, I will mute myself again or switch off my camera, is um, today I was with the project management team and um, the CIO. And this particular team, they were in trouble last year. And that's where I also reached out to my Patrick um, Lencioni book. And based on this, the, the traits that I saw, I actually called this team out and I said, guys, based on this book, this is what I see. It means you guys are dysfunctional. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I was really attacked big time from all angles. And I said, guys, I'm just saying, this is the things that I'm seeing. This is what it is. I'm not saying let's fight about what the facts are. Let's see how can we improve. And I think I was two sessions in with the team trying to get rid of the dysfunctions that they were having and building trust and building transparency amongst them again and opening communication lines. Then we had a restructure. So in October, late October, beginning November, we had a restructure and I was just not happy about it. But yesterday, the 1 p.m. came back to me and she said, girl, you must look at my team's so burn down. Mm. And, and she showed it to me and it was literally a nice burn down that shows how they were closing tasks throughout the sprint. And, and when I spoke to the CIO today, I said to him, you know what, you made me very angry last year when you did the restructure, you effectively undid what I did. Mm -hmm. But I must say thank you to the team and the PM that was with this team, because it shows some resilience that the team has built during the period. And now this is their burn down. Obviously, there's still space for improvement, but they did a stunning job in at least getting the one burn down right. So I said to them, they must use this as a benchmark for next month's sprint. Nice, very nice. Yeah, I when there is enough trust in the company, I really like also teams to do self-assessments or help them with it. Like when you say show, hey, this is where you're at. Do you agree? I like that. Or And how can you get like uh, overcome these things? Um, that's, I like that. But in certain companies, people don't, feel free to admit that they're not doing well yet as a team or personally. Mm -hmm. uh, and that we're back to, you know, first thing to build is trust, right? Yeah. yeah. So thanks but for sharing. But with the tools, I haven't come up with anything that I can say. I've planted the seed, the seed is there, the seed just needs to grow. The seed is under the ground, this is how big the seed is. I, I don't have any measure on, on putting no. that. No, and sometimes it takes um, longer or something like COVID has to happen and suddenly it is possible or, Yes. We have uh, a last minute. What? So yeah. I have a last question for you here. Okay. And that's if you should say one thing people should remember from this conversation, mm. what it should be. 
I, I guess what I've learned, like I said, I was the product owner of my body, but in the end, you know, we're all, you're the, we're all the product owner of our own lives. Um, and it's all about agile values. So figure out what brings most value to your life and then go there right? with little steps, inspect and adapt. Sometimes maybe the value changes because you grow older or situations change, but that's what I'd like to, you don't have to get ill to uh, realize that uh, time and energy are limited. So, uh, or that you have to have a purpose in life. So whatever brings value to you, whether you want to be a career woman or a mommy at home or whatever, whatever it brings value to you and the people around you, of course, uh, work towards that in tiny little steps. That would be my uh, life lesson. Thank you very much. You're welcome. And thank you for being open. Talk to us. I hope people find some inspiration in those stories. In